Right, okay, the next one we're going on to. This is one John um, did many, many years ago, probably in the 60s. And it's called the Persuader. It, it, was, it was designed for Hanningfield. He, he was fishing there in the days when there were very good hatches of fly. And then over the years, the hatches gradually went down and down. And the fish were coming up less and less. But he knew there were some big browns in there. And so this was put together really as to not suggest anything in particular, but a bit like the gold repairs here, where you don't know really what it suggests, but it suggests a lot of things. And this was the same thing. It isn't particular for one thing, but it's, it's got the orange, which is good for attracted in still water. It's got the rear end sort of pale, like a sedge would be, that sort of thing. So, so that was his persuader. And it was one, I think, in fly time and fly fishing this last month, I think, Charles Jardine was still extolling the virtues of it. He, except he, was, he wanted to change it. Yeah, except he wanted to change it. That's right, yeah. Charles does it. Right, we'll just put that down there. Put that out of the way for the moment. See what else we can get out. Is it a weighted fly, that? Yes, it's a weighted one. I'm going to put some lead in it for you, John. <laughs> right, let's get a, get a hook put. Now, this one, I have put on a long shank hook because um, it's one of John's very early patterns which um, he used a long shank for. Because this was for getting down, this is when people started using sinking lines. And uh, just remember John's talking about, he started his trout fishing probably in the early, at least the, by the 60s he was trout fishing. I mean, probably when he started his, his trout fishing, it was all traditional, you know, Peter Ross's and things like this, and Alexander's and this, and he, he realised that there was, um, you could, there must be a way of catching a lot of these fish on flies that look like the real thing. So here we go then, John. We're going to put some um, put some lead on for you. Just wind some lead on there. Not over the whole of the shank, about two thirds of it. Leave room at the eyes for what you want to for for working at the eye. Just just put that on there and see how much we put on there. Go on to some orange thread. First thing you do is keep a longish tail, put your nail behind the lead, put, put some turns in front, then come over it. Now that lead's trapped, it's not going to move along the shank at all, it's trapped by the thread. And that little, little shoulder we've got at the back, that's where we put the ribbing in to keep the underbody smooth. So we've got some oval silver this time. Just wind, push that on the top until it butts up to the lead. It butts up because we're filling in that space at the back. Okay. And then we can see that we can see where we've got. Got plenty of lead on there. That should get it down. And quite a big hook. The next thing, for the rear of the body, <coughs> we use some white ostrich. I haven't brought all the feathers. I've tried to sort of just keep things to a minimum here tonight to talk about the flies rather than spend all day sorting materials out. So if I put three or four pieces of white ostrich tail together, there we are. That's what's going to make our, our rear body. But um, And I'll show you how I, how I strengthen it because it can be quite fragile. Just, just cut all the tips off together so we, could, so we know what we're looking at. Tie them in at the back again. Tie them in nice and tight there. And then, where's my, I've lost my dubbing spinner. Oh, here we are. We'll need the spinner again. This tool you'll see in action a lot tonight. Then we make a loop, which is just shorter than the material. Bring your thread all the way up to the front again now. Two thirds of the way along to where the, that's where the rear body. Now I've got a pear shaped loop. Put, put the ostrich on the top, come up out through the loop one side, over the top and pick up the thread. And now that is trapped between those threads. Just give it a quick spin. And that strengthened your ostrich up. And what do you see what we've got now? 
You can yeah. see it's twisted with the thread now. <clears throat> and don't, don't worry if it flattens a bit. Just wind that along now. There we go. To about the two, till we come to where we want our, our thorax to be, about there, two thirds of the way along. Let that hang so you can tie that off underneath. So you can see we've got a nice fluffy body. Because what John liked was things that move in the water. When, I mean, if he was just fishing a nymph or something, you'd make sure that when it got to the fish, it actually moved. It didn't just drift by. You know, the induced take, which everybody talks about, that was what he liked. He, you know, sometimes he, I'd cast and he'd say, right, now, John, and, and you'd lift it as he, you know. It's not as easy as you think, this induced take, I can tell you, because either you're too late because it's gone past the fish or you're too early and it goes over the fish. <laughs> but knowing the art of actually getting the induced take at the right time <clears throat> is something that has to be learned, I think, yeah. Anyway, so that we'll, we'll rib that now with some oval silver. That's it. Luckily, uh, our tinsels have all uh, got better these days. We can get non-tarnishing ones. And originally, they used to be, you know, metallic. And they, after a little while, uh, they'd. I, I don't know if many of you remember. Years ago, there was a lady, Jackie Wakeford. Remember? Yeah. Many of you remember her. Yeah. She came to give us a talk, and we don't see her these days. But um, she used to buff her because the tinsel was metallic. She used to buff it up with a piece of leather before she put it on. But she was very good, very good, I don't know. She brought out probably the, what was the first ever book on colour for colour photographs of fly tying. So what we do now is you can just ease that out if you want with it. All that is is a peg with a bit of Velcro on, with the hook part of Velcro on. So there you can see what that is. There, there, you can see where the, the, the peg, the, the hooks are on that. And that's all you need. Have you patented that one, John? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, so does the gypsies do? You don't need to spend any money on your, on the tools, really. <coughs> but one thing, just while I'm really talking about that tools, I mean, my vice is, is only you know the bottom of the range, twenty quid's worth. But it's, I've tied thousands of flies in there, I can assure you. And but what I have got is an empty empty uh, bot varnish bottle at home on my desk, which has got some bicycle oil, light oil, and I make sure that that can inside is kept oiled every sort of three or four months. I put a few blobs of oil down there because I found that when it got dry once, it didn't, you didn't get the pressure on the hook. It must, the friction must have been stopping it actually clamping right up. And so now I just put a bit of oil in there and we're away again, you know. I mean, I'd say this it's tied thousands. And this vice is still available to buy. It's still, still around. I think they call it the Regal or something like that, do they? Yeah. I mean, I saw one in the magazine this month. Um, someone's bought it, and they want £310 for a vice. Well, I thought, well, I'd rather spend £310 on something else, you know. Make one cheaper, John. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So, and now, we put the wing case in next, just the case that goes over the top. And for that, I used some hen pheasant. And for that, hen pheasant splits very easily. I tell you, it's, you know, you... When you use it for wings, so when, when, when I'm using it, I always I don't try stripping it off. I just cut it off, and I know I can hold the ends together. Then, so we've got quite a wide piece, and what we're going to do is we're going to encompass the top 180 degrees of the shank of the hook with that. So put it on your side, I just and just let it roll over, and there we've got some material ready. For the, for the case to grow the top of the thorax. So again, make sure that's nice and tight where we want it. And I'll put all that together over there. This time, if you haven't seen me before, I always use a, a board to, that's got a bit of, little bit of foam underneath, so I can roll on, or you can pick hooks up off easy. It's only a little piece of hardboard or a bit of thick cardboard with a piece of foam on top and a sheet on, a piece of white sheet on top of that. So th this is just ordinary antron dubbing. Again, make sure before you use it that it's teased right out. Because 
because we don't want, it's, you'll never put, put dubbing on if it's got sort of lumps or hard pieces in it, you'll never, you can never get it on properly. So that, that should be enough for what we want. Again, bring your thread away, round your finger, go back over it to make a loop, bring it forward nearly to the eye, and again, don't worry if that too, looks too much at the moment, because that will be spread along the hook. Just put it inside the loop. Can you see what, where it goes in there? There looks a mountain of it in there at the moment. But what you can do is just spread that right along. Anyway, I've had pulled half of it off. So you can see we've got much less in there now. And if I just spin that up, you can see what we've got. We've got our dubbed dub thread. No need to use wax. Just just dub it in there because you'll find it's locked into locked into the threads. Just just ease that off a bit there. <laughs> it's just Antron dubbing, John. Actually, this one I think is is the one. Um, if anybody you know makes stuffed teddy bears and things like that, this is the same fur that that you find. You just chop it up into shorter lengths and. That's cruel. <laughs> yeah. Right, okay, now, just... Now we know as we're stealing those, cutting those teddy bears. Yeah, <laughs> just pull that back. And then we seem to have got a long... Teddy bear seen outside Along the uh, fibre there, but don't worry about that for the moment. We'll tidy that up in a minute. Can you see how we've got it nice and fluffy back then? Just pull the wing case over and put your thumb on the top, just to spread it. That's it, there we go. That's it. That's, that's done. There is a quick quick tip. You know, sometimes when you put a, a, on a pheasant tail wing case or some over and it makes a bit of a chunk at the end <clears throat> and, it, and you do your whip finish and all of a sudden it comes off, off, off the hook. What you do is turn your hook upside down before you do the whip finish. And there, that's not going to run off anywhere. There's a persuader. It might look fluffy, but when it's in the water, it all, all, all moves on the side there. Mm. So What's that? What would you know? that was well that, that's a long shank ten join. Okay. Um, uh, this because remember this was invented, you know, in the years when people were all lure fishing and all that sort of and this was looked on as a normal sort of size hook to use. You know, but I think these these days are much smaller hooks are used, aren't they, and things. But uh, but it's still a very good pattern, as you can see. It, it doesn't represent any particular thing, but it, you can imagine it. There's bits of lot of a lot of things in there. So that that's uh, that's his persuader anyway. So just just better put a bit of varnish on that head for him. <laughs> and when you put your varnish on. Don't go in there and then come up and try and put it like that, because otherwise the varnish will be down on your fingers within a few minutes. Just come from the top always when you're putting your varnish on, and then it will always keep at the eye. So any questions on that? Or I'll just trim one of those bits away from, from the eye there, but uh, you see there's no need to go over the eye at all. There's a clean eye there for, uh, for tying in on. <coughs> Hey, probably in the 60s John invented that. It's still as good today as it ever was. And, uh, and it, it, it worked. They caught lots of the, the browns that uh, sort of were refusing to rise anymore, you know. And, and when well, I say refusing, they didn't, there was nothing to them so much to induce them up, you know. And,